We are folks, Brother Peter with tidbits from the Word. So proud to be with you today. We need to think about if we were going to pattern our life after Jesus, uh, what was his first things that he did? Some of the first things he told us. In Mark chapter 1, he told us some things. He told us that uh, one of the first things he was going to do is he was going to preach throughout Galilee, their, his local place first. And then he was going to go into the uttermost parts of the world, too. But he rose up. When Jesus got up in the morning, what time do you think he got up? Well, it says here in 35, a long while before daylight. And, and when he got up, what did he do? He went out. And where did he go? Well, he went to a place. Uh, where he would be free from dis distractions or any other problems or anything uh, that would bother him. And uh, he spent some time in the prayer. Uh, not just a little time. He spent a pretty good bit of time in prayer. And he, he was, even though he was the son of Jehovah, the son of God, he was also the servant of God. Uh, while he was walking on this earth, his duty was to re maintain total uh, connection with the Father. Total connection with the Father. Everything he did had to be pleasing to the Father and was to please the Father. And he wanted God to open his ears first thing in the morning hearing him praying. Not that God ever shuts his ears off, but he wants him to hear him, and he wanted instruction for the day. He wanted to get instruction for the day. And that's what he was looking for. If you've got a Bible, and i got one right here, and I'm going to flip open to another one while i got this one open right here, to the book of Isaiah. And now we're going to look at Isaiah chapter 50. It's Psalms, Proverbs, Isaiah. And Isaiah uh, chapter 50, verse 4 and 5. Let's look at that. Isaiah chapter 54. You know Isaiah 53 tells all about Jesus coming. But let's look at Isaiah 50. And we're there now. 49 and 50. And we're going to look at, at uh, verses 4 and 5. It said, The Lord God hath given me the tongue of the learned that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. He, he, he wakeneth morning by morning. He wakeneth mine ear. He here as a learner. The Lord God hath opened mine ear, and I was not rebellious, neither turned away my back. And that's talking about Jesus. That's <laughs> talking about him, the Son of God. But he's saying we are supposed to be the exact same. We are to mimic Jesus or put our life like Jesus did. And you know, if the Lord felt like he needed to get up early in the morning and felt like he needed to talk to the Father, and we only talk to the Father now through the Son, we talk to the Father through the Son, through Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, and we talk to the Father, should we not do it early in the morning? How much more should we notice as the day is at uh, approaching the end of, of this uh, era, this world, this day is approaching. How much more should we do what he did? He prayed. And he went out. It cost him something to pray. It, it wasn't just laying in bed, which I've done a million times. I laid in bed and just laid in bed and prayed in the morning, early in the morning. 
My daddy used to drop out beside the bed and pray. But, but Jesus didn't just drop up beside the bed. He rose up. Found himself a quiet place. Uh, a place where God he had met him before, I'm sure. A long while before daylight. Not just a few minutes now before day, but a long while before daylight. I was saved a long while before daylight. I was saved at 3 o'clock in the morning, November 5th, 1972. And the Lord wakes me up now at 3 o'clock in the morning. Lately, it's been about 2.30 he wakes me up. So that by 3 o'clock, I could be on the YouTube, doing some uh, something on the YouTube. But in studying this lesson I'm studying right here, I see that I need to do more praying before I do more studying. Long before daylight. And his prayer was personal to the Father. He was convinced enough that God, his father, needed him to talk to him in the morning, that he made it a discipline in his life. Have you got any disciplines in your life? Do I have any disciplines in my life? I have a couple. Not many. I'm not very disciplined. I'm not as disciplined as I ought to be. And I don't know if any of us are as disciplined as we ought to be. But it's very, it's a, it's a personal matter. It's a very personal matter. It, it's not at our convenience that we should serve God always. Yes, we should serve God when it's convenient to do. But we ought to serve Him when it's not convenient. It's called self-discipline. And sacrifice. This probably explains why so much of our churches today and our services today are ineffective. And I, even personally, I so ineffective sometimes and most of the time. We went out with prayer the other day. It just so happened walking down this street that God had every person that opened the door to us was a person needing the Word of God and were ready for it. And were willing to jump right on the bandwagon and say, yes, I'll ask Jesus to forgive me of my sin, come in my heart and save my soul. You think that was coincidence? No. That was the answer to prayer. That was the answer to getting up early in the morning and fellowshipping with God. And he prepared the way for the day. He prepared the street. He prepared what was to come for the day. Yes, it matters. It matters a whole lot. Our personal connection with God has got to be early in the morning. In chapter 1, 36 through 37, Simon, by the time Simon and others got up and the crowd got up and was gathered outside the house again, the disciples went to tell the Lord of a rising popular sentiment. Verse 38, it said, <laughs> surprisingly, <laughs> to them it was surprisingly. To them it was surprisingly. That he didn't get all upset and all uptight. And he didn't go running back to the city to... to grab the disciples up and surrounding the town. But he went to the town and he preached there also. 
Why didn't he turn, return to Capernaum? Because God was using him there. God is going to use you where he directs you. If he directs you somewhere, that's where he's going to use you. I can't go to just any filling station when the Lord tells me to go out 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning out to a filling station and witness to people. I can't go to just any filling station. I have to go to one he sends me to. There's one right down the road here, and the Lord knows that when he sends me down there, he's always got somebody there. He, they may be from Oklahoma, Wyoming, Wisconsin, New York. The tags will be from everywhere. And they've stopped at this truck stop filling station and on their way home to gas up right there in that particular spot. And God said, I'm going to have one down there. You'll be down there at quarter past two, and I'm going to have a man. He's already going to be at the pump when you pull up. And you talk to him. Just like when Philip went. <laughs> God said to Philip, go join yourself to that chariot. You think he's not the same God? You think he doesn't do the same thing? He's the same God that does the same thing. And one and 38, it said the towns preached there also. Let's notice what he did, first of all. He'd just been in prayer. And he had learned from God what God wanted him to do. For the day. Second thing. He recognized that the popular movement in Capernaum was shallow. And the Savior was never attached by large crowds. That didn't attract him. Large crowds didn't attract him. That wasn't what he was looking for. He was not, he was not parading his own self and warning a large crowd. And as I go out visiting myself, I find out the large crowds sometimes are a hindrance. That we need to be in a place of uh, just a small group. Jesus always looked below the surface, below the surface that was up top. And he always looked into the heart of men. Many times he said to men, why do you think, say in your heart, or why do you think, or why this, or why that? And he was talking about their thoughts. And he was talking about what they had in the center lobe of their mind right here. The heart of the mind. He knew that the, the perils that were going to come on the disciples. He knew that they uh, would not be popular. Uh, he knew that uh, his word was not going to be popular. And he said to the disciples, he said, Look, you guys beware when all men speak good of you. If all men speak good of somebody, there's something wrong. Because they hate me. They're going to put me on the cross. <laughs> and probably put some of you on the cross too. So he constantly avoided superficial and emotional and and the things that were demonstrations that would have brought the man forward and put God behind. So be careful. Be careful. Be careful. When you're serving God, be careful. You don't bring yourself up and put, the God, and put the Lord God behind you. You need God in front of you at all times. You don't need God behind you. Oh, You want him behind you, but not behind you, behind you. You want him behind you with his hands on your shoulders saying, Good boy. He constantly avoided Jesus did not want confrontation. 
He wanted commitment. He didn't want a, de uh, a demonstration of emotion in a, a, a bunch. He wanted commitment from them. His great emphasis in all of his preaching was the Word. By the way, he was the Word. He said, in the beginning I was the Word. I was with God. And I was the Word. And I was made flesh and came and dwelt among you. So here is the Word of God in the flesh walking across the country in this day. And he chose to take some others with him. So many of them wanted their their um, thoughts and emotions and their thinking was, ah, hey, if we follow him, we're going to see him heal somebody. We're going to see him do some miracle. Jesus was looking at their human misery. And he wanted to enter their hearts and take the misery from them. But if they were looking for something besides him being the Messiah, or him taking away the things or doing things for them, and they're looking for a sign, he'll, they'll get a sign, but God won't give it to them. The devil makes signs, and people jump on board and say, well, I had a sign. I saw a bright light. Well, the devil's an angel of light. Verse 39, chapter 1. The synagogue is where Paul the Apostle, after he was saved, would go. First coming into town, he would go into the synagogue. And Jesus did the same thing. He went in the synagogues throughout all Galilee. Preaching and casting out demons. Where? In the synagogue. <laughs> Did you know he cast more demons out in the synagogue than he did anywhere else? Because those people had come into the synagogue, the demons had come in, and the demons were confusing the people. And when Jesus came in, the demons knew who he was, and he cast them out. And... and It's real interesting, isn't it? The liberal churches we have today are full of people that are full of demons. Full of demonic people sitting in the pew. As of late, I'm going to say 43 years, as of late, I've really done some study about this NIV. This NIV version of the Bible. About this good news for modern man. About all of these Bibles other than the King James Version. How that they have taken half of the words from the King James Version out. How they changed that, that Jesus is the morning star, not Lucifer. How they changed different things. What Jesus did in chapter 1 and verse 40 to 45, he did cleanse a leper. And he did it for an example. That he had prayed to his father and God answered him. And as he went out, everything that he needed to do for the day, he was prepared to do it. And God answered that prayer and God was with him and God said, okay. Are you earnest? Are you desperate when you employ God when you pray? Are you in earnest? Are you desperate? Are you desperate to see something for the day? Man, I don't like to go out and to win souls for a day and come home with no souls. There's only one thing wrong with that. And I know what it is. It's wrong with it's me. 
If I go out and come back without a soul, it's me. I stood between God and some man and got in trouble and that man didn't ask the Lord to save me. Hey, when the power of God's on you and you're talking to somebody, you're going to know it. You're going to know it. You're going to know it because you're going to, you're not only going to, you're, you're going to feel it. Listen to what this, this uh, important man said to him, this leper. He was employing him. He kneeled down to him. Now we need to employ the Father early in the morning. And we need to kneel down to him. And we need to humble ourselves in submissiveness to our Father God. Through his son Jesus Christ. And, and he says to the man, if you are willing, wow. What he was asking the man is, are you willing to believe? Are you willing? He said, make me clean. The guy said, make me clean. He acknowledged the need. And Jesus answered his need. That was a personal question to Jesus, make me clean. Do you ask God to make you clean? You say, God, make me clean? You say, <laughs> you say God, I'm, I'm inferior. I am inferior. And I have a terrible head on me and an old brain sometimes it really gives me trouble. Would you make me clean, God? Would you make me clean enough so when I go to witness or to talk to somebody that they know that they are, have got the presence of God coming after them. This man was specific. He's asking the Son of God to bless him. Bless me, he said. And make me clean. It was personal. Very personal. It was brief. Only five words. In the original, notice what happened. Jesus was moved with compassion. Wow. When you pray to him, He's moved with compassion. This man said five words and Jesus was moved with compassion. <laughs> we need not to ever frivolously come in prayer. When we come in prayer, we need to be in earnest. So we can see what's going to happen when the compassion of God through His Son, Jesus Christ, surrounds us and gets around us and takes hold of us and we can get up with an exultation. We can get up with a gratitude. Do a lightheaded. <laughs> Sometimes you feel like maybe you could fly. You could be, 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 get close to God. You have to get close to God yourself. The only way you can do it is... Uh, he stretched out his hand, by the way. And touched him. Wow. We can't really read these words without getting the sense that Jesus can reach out still and touch us. Stretch out his hand and touch him. Just think of the hand of God touching you. Wow.
if you humble yourself in what we would call believer's prayer, really believing that God's going to answer your prayer, you're going to get an answer. You know, back in those days under the law, you couldn't touch a leper. You'd have to go around screaming unclean, unclean, unclean. That leper was having to scream unclean already, already. Standing before God, he was having to say unclean, unclean. But Jesus took his hand out and touched him. And, and this is what he said to him, I'm willing. He was more than willing. He was able. And when he said, be clean, cleansed, be cleansed is what he said, be cleansed. In an instant, the skin of the leper was as smooth as baby skin and clean and clear. And his rags fell off. And he raised his hand and he said, I'm clean, I'm clean. He'd been hollering. I'm dirty, I'm dirty. He'd been hollering, unclean, unclean. And he left the un off now and he said, I'm clean, I'm clean. And he looks and he's clean. I said before in the beginning of this at 3 o'clock in the morning, I looked up to heaven and said, Jesus, I am a sinner. I'm that leper. I had the leprosy of sin. Jesus reached down from heaven and knocked that from me. Never to desire to take another drink of liquor or alcohol or beer. Never desire to swear another cuss word. Never desired to do from then on what I want to do, but I want to do what God wants me to do. And that's 43 years ago or so, and I'm still the same way. I'm still desiring to do that even more. During this period of time, Jesus told a man to go show himself to the priest, if I got this story correct. The reason why, it was under the Old Testament law. And under the Old Testament law, it hadn't been fulfilled yet 100% until Jesus went to the cross, the law was still in effect. And it was a requirement that a Christian person or a person that was saved would follow the laws of the land. And so you had to follow the laws of the land. So he sent the man to the priest to tell the priest what happened. This was a test. Of, of obedience. Would he do as he was told? If he did not, he would not have probably been healed. So he had to do what the Lord said to do. And it was also a test for the priest. that discernment would come into that priest's life and he would perceive that Jesus Christ was the long-awaited Messiah. What was a, a real dilemma in the sense of the word was here was the man the priest knew all about. They had studied the book from cover to cover. They knew the whole Old Testament. And they knew there was a prophesied one coming, Jesus. But what they were still, the, even the priests were looking for 
a kingdom to be set up. But you know the priest, he missed the mark. The people saw and the priest saw the miracles and the healing. It was typical of the Israel, the nation of Israel, to see things with their eyes and not believe them with their heart. I know another country that's just like that. It's called the United States of America. We have the Bible, the KJV Bible, right in front of us that has the power to save a man without talking to anybody. You can be reading the King James Version Bible, and when you come across those words, John 3, 16, God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever, and you know that's you, believeth in Him, shall not perish, but have everlasting life. He didn't send his son in the world, condemn the world, but that the world would be saved. You remember, Jesus went into a deserted place. And he did some things in a deserted place. And he had all of his dealings were successful. I have been in a crowd. I have I have won a girl, a cashier. A girl. I, I, I know there's a lady behind me. And I say to the girl, I take my little track out. And uh, I said to the girl, she's there at the register. And I said, by the way, while you're, while you're adding that out and racking that up, you can do two things. I'm an evangelist of a faith Baptist church. This track says, if you died right now, would you go to heaven? And she's ringing up the groceries. She said, no, I, I wouldn't. Well, I said, wouldn't you like to? She said, yes, I would. Well, I said, you ain't got to close your eyes or nothing. Just say this little prayer with me. Say, dear God, I'm a sinner. Forgive me of my sin. Come in my heart and save my soul. She's ringing up the groceries saying, dear God, I am a sinner. Forgive me of my sin. Come in my heart and save my soul. She rings me up, I pay her. Nobody know the difference. And we went through the line and there is a cashier that has salvation. <laughs> That's how simple salvation is. And Jesus healing this leper. That's how simple it was. If you'll continue in Mark and read that story on, you'll see he healed a paralytic. And then you'll see that he, he did some other things. He, uh, 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 the call of Levi, call Levi. And then we see the scribes and Pharisees were always in the picture, uh, causing some kind of uproar. And the tax collectors and the sinners, and Jesus said, who's, who's, uh, Who's, who's inscription on this coin? And they said, Caesar's. He said, Render unto Caesar what Caesar's. Unto God what's God. Then a controversy came out about fasting in this, in, in this book of Mark, chapter 2. The controversy over the Sabbath, which is uh, on a Saturday was their day of rest, but Jesus is going to rise from the grave on Sunday, first day of the week. And he's going to change the whole kit and caboodle. When he was on the cross, he said, It is finished. He rent the veil from top to bottom. And as he rent that veil, he said, The law is finished. No man can now go behind that veil ever again and talk to God that way. If he wants to talk to God, he's got to come through me. I now am the meteor. I am now the mediator and the meteor. And I am... God in the flesh. I was God the Father. I was with Him. He made me God the Son, sent me down to the earth, 
and now I am going to heaven, I'm sending you the Holy Spirit to bear witness in your heart that, that when you ask me, I do come in. Can't keep my Bible, my big Bible. I can't keep my big Bible on the table here. So, we see that he went out uh, through the Sabbath and Mark. Our time's come and gone, but I wanted to, to uh, talk about some of the things he did. He healed a servant on the Sabbath, which was a holy day according to the Jews. And they didn't like it too well. And the Pharisees and those of Herodians' court and the great multitude strong and the servant. We see Jesus, the servant of God, calling and training some disciples. He calls these disciples here in Mark chapter 3 and he starts training them. And he also had one that the devil took over. And committed the unpardonable sin. It was pardonable as long as he was alive. But he killed himself. A lot of people take that as the unpardonable sin. That's not the unpardonable sin. The unpardonable sin was that he killed himself before he asked Jesus, forgive him of his sin, come in his heart and save his soul. Now it is possible for a believer, a Christian person, to get so far away from God, and they're still going to die and go to heaven, to kill themselves. That's not the unpardonable sin. They're just going to get to heaven before we do. That's a forgivable sin. <laughs> Paul gave that some thought. Paul said, uh, man, Boys, I, I, you know, I just soon go right now, but it's needful I stay because you guys need me here to help you out. So he stayed. So if you're going to do a good study, get yourself in the book of Mark and do a good study. If, if you've been saved a little while, you ought to be able to understand it and, and go along with it and find out what it is. Well, our time's come and gone. I'm about seven minutes over time. And uh, we're going to cut this thing off at uh, uh, 37, 38 minutes. And we'll see you next time. Brother Peter with tidbits from the world.